I have not seen effective inclusive classrooms that are not embedded in, in small group instruction. Right through, like newsflash, you can do small group instruction in secondary. Right? Right through. And those groups are formulated in a flexible way in accordance to answering how the children do. Some will need more time on the concept. Some will need to move on. Some will need to solidify and broaden and connect their learning. How do we do that? How do we organize our classrooms? How do we create the conditions so that small group instruction can be managed? Many people say, I don't do small group instruction because of the behavior. <coughs> Call on these kids. Call on their strength. Uh, organize your classrooms and do it from day one. Trying to flip a classroom's process at Christmas is way harder than starting it out in September. Teachers need to learn all the time and need to be able to articulate what they're doing and why. We will achieve this if we can create the conditions that if the leadership of a school, a colleague, a, a support staff, a parent, a community member go walk into a teacher's room, freeze the children, and have a conversation with the teacher about why are you doing this activity with this group of kids right now? Why this with them now? If we can answer that question, the great answers start with, because yesterday I noticed, that's diagnostic assessment. Because the last time that that student and I conferenced over a piece of reading or writing, we said, uh, because yesterday I introduced and it went, I'm not even sure if this kid was in the room, right? Because all of those are diagnostic statements. Great classrooms that achieve equity and inclusion operate and flow down to see the diagnostic assessment. And it doesn't have to be formal, right? And then that diagnostic assessment and that teacher's professional judgment informs the grouping, informs the learning, informs the activity, and engages the kids. So agency for the teacher, I'm a big fan of. Uh, uh, um, professional judgment. But I also think that professional judgment is rooted in professional obligation. Right? You, you exercise professional judgment based on what research tells us. What our professional colleagues tell us. What, what other kinds of assessments tell us. All of that factors into a teacher's professional judgment. You know, I always say to teachers, if you're going to tell me professional judgment is your gut, I'm going to tell you to take that through this long. <laughs> right? Because it has to be an informed kind of endeavor. But I'd like us to think about some of the language that exists in our school. Any time our language creates otherness, it should, somebody should be able to say, There's, we need to think about that. Right? If we're talking about the kids and the learning center kids, we need to think about that. That's othering. Right? So, so we want to look at, we want to look at carefully at how the kids are doing and how do we know in a disaggregated way. Because for 25 years ago in Nova Scotia, we received the Black Report. Mm -hmm. Then we received the Reality Check. The African Nova Scotian community uh, has been saying to us, our children are doing well. And our response is, well, we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this. And they say, but our children are doing well. And they said, well, we're doing this, and we're doing it. We say, well, we're doing this, and we're doing this, right? That's a system that's focusing on action versus impact, right? So we need to get braver. We need to say, they're not doing well. Maybe we don't know. Who could help us? How we say, our doors are open for community. We have to ask, why aren't the community coming in? And maybe we need to go out, right? So this is about rethinking. Um, all teachers can teach to high standards given the right conditions and assistance. The call on inclusion is really rooted in the 90s and, and the beginning of, of, of the 2000s, where systems all over the world were really narrowly focused on literacy and numeracy, and set a success benchmark of 70% of the kids reaching those benchmarks, or 75% of those kids reaching those benchmarks. And so when systems, schools, classrooms, uh, regions, achieve that, they went, we're good, we're done. 
we need to flip the coin over and say, who have we left behind? Because great systems don't leave 30% of their kids or 25% of their kids behind. And then we need to get real about who's in the group we left behind. Because there are different, we did. We brought Dr. Holly in this year around cultural competency. We, uh, we're going to continue to drive that work because that's an action. If our kids don't start telling us that it feels different to be able to talk about their own lived experiences in our schools, in our materials, in our staff, start to reflect them and, and, and their cultures and families better, then we've done an action with no impact. I need everybody to take their collective um, talents and knowledge about kids because every school's got a rich body of, of talent and knowledge. And I need you to focus on how are the children doing? Who's not there yet? And how do we move them? And I need you to do that in a way that um, reflects that all kids can learn with enough time and support.